In my seven years as a park ranger, I witnessed my fair share of odd events. But there's one story in my years of service that stands out. It's not something that I usually share, but it feels right to get it off my chest. The park where I worked, I'm not going to name it since I still have friends who work there. The park wasn't exactly what you'd call a tourist hotspot, but it had its fair share of visitors. Enough to keep a ranger busy, but not overwhelmed. My days were a mix of the mundane and the mildly exciting, a balance that kept things interesting. My duties were varied, manning the ranger station, tending to trails, monitoring wildlife, ensuring visitor safety, things like that. I led nature walks too, guiding groups of wide-eyed kids and curious adults through the winding trails. If you look to your left, you'll see an oak tree that's been here for over 500 years, and things like that. I'd explain pointing out the landmarks and hidden gems in the park. Their expressions, a mix of awe and wonder, never got old. Enforcing the rules was less fun, but necessary. Hey, you can't camp here, this area's off limits. I'd remind overzealous campers, or fishing's not allowed in this part of the river. It wasn't about being a buzzkill, but it was about keeping them safe and the park safe. Whether I was repairing a signpost or calmly handling a curious bear sighting, each task carried its own satisfaction. The park was more than just my workplace. It felt like a living, breathing entity that I had the privilege of stewarding. Now, most of my time as a park ranger was spent on the day shift. The day shift was about interaction, helping people, and sharing in their joy of nature. But sometimes, sometimes my schedule would rotate and I would find myself assigned to the night shift. And not necessarily a bad thing. The night shift was a different beast altogether. It was peaceful. The hustle and bustle of the day gave way to an almost sacred calm. The chattering of daytime wildlife was replaced by the soft hoots of owls and the occasional rustle of nocturnal creatures in the underbrush. I actually loved these nights in their own way. Night patrols were, without a doubt, one of my favorite parts of being a park ranger. There was something about the stillness of the night, the way that the moonlight filtered through the trees, casting silvery shadows on the forest floor. Like I said, it's peaceful, almost otherworldly, and I found myself savoring these moments of solitude amidst nature's nocturnal symphony. Most of these nights, my duties were simple and uneventful. The biggest disruptions I faced were usually just rowdy teenagers trying to sneak in a late night party in one of the secluded clearings. I would settle them down, there'd be some grumbling, the clinking of bottles, and the flicker of hastily extinguished flashlights as they scurried away. Occasionally, I'd have to help a camper who got turned around in the dark find their way back to their campsite. These encounters, the routine, never felt like a nuisance. They were part of the job. Like I said, I really did love the nighttime shift, even though most of the other rangers didn't. I felt blessed to have the privilege of having the job. Now, on the night of the events of this story, I was working the night shift. It had been a smooth evening so far spent partly at the station and partly patrolling the campsites on foot. Everything was quiet, no issues at all. Just a typical, peaceful night in the park. When I headed out on my midnight patrol, the conditions were perfect. The sky was clear, a vast canvas of stars stretching endlessly above. The temperature was a comfortable mid-sixties, not too cold, not too warm. Ideal for camping, I thought to myself. It was the kind of night that made you grateful to be outside. A night that promised tranquility. I remember taking a deep breath as I stepped out of the ranger station, the crisp air filling my lungs. The moon was bright, almost full, casting a soft, ethereal glow over the park. 
The trees swayed gently in the night breeze. I headed for one of the ranger trucks, ready to patrol. Now, typically for my midnight patrols, I would rely on the truck. It wasn't just a matter of convenience. The truck allowed me to cover more ground efficiently. It was especially useful when checking the main roads and some of the campsites that were scattered across the park. I drove slowly through the park. The window of my ranger truck rolled down to let in the cool night air. About 45 minutes into my patrol, I found myself on a narrow dirt road that snaked its way through a particularly dense part of the forest. The road was dark, the canopy of the trees overhead almost completely blotting out the moonlight. My truck's headlights cut a swath through the darkness, illuminating the road ahead in a stark yellow glow. The gravel crunched under the tires, the sound seemingly louder and more pronounced in the stillness of the night. This part of the park always felt more isolated, more wild, or something. Along this secluded stretch of road, there were several pull-offs. Little more than gravel spaces carved into the woods. They were mainly used by us rangers for quick access to trails during the daytime. At night, these trails were gated off, a measure to ensure both the safety of visitors and, of course, the park. As I drove, my headlights briefly illuminated several of these pull-offs as I passed. I slowed as I passed, making sure that the gates were all securely locked. Tonight, like most nights, there was nothing. Just the quiet, undisturbed entrances to slumbering trails and the night forest surrounding them, silent and watchful. Then, as I approached one of the last pull-offs, my headlights revealed something unexpected. A truck parked sideways across the road, almost completely blocking it. I slowed to a stop. This was unusual, especially at this hour. The truck was an old, beat-up model, its paint peeling and one headlight dimmer than the other. I killed the engine and I sat there for a moment, surveying the scene. The truck's position was almost deliberate, an intentional barricade. There was no sign of an accident, no skid marks or debris, just the truck. My mind raced with possibilities. Was someone injured? Did they need help? Was this some kind of prank by local troublemakers? I reached for my radio, ready to call this in, but something held me back. A niggling sense of unease crept up my spine. An instinct that something was off. The forest had gone silent, as if it was waiting for what would happen next. Like I said, the truck's headlights were still on, cutting through the darkness and casting long, ominous shadows into the woods. The driver's door was ajar. A sign of a hasty exit, I couldn't tell. But like I said, the situation felt wrong. I grabbed my flashlight and I stepped out of my truck, my senses heightened. The beam of my flashlight sliced through the night, illuminating the area next to the truck. There was no sign of a struggle, no footprints leading away into the forest. It was as if the driver had simply vanished into thin air. I approached the truck cautiously, my hand hovering near my radio, ready to call for backup. There was no one inside. The cab was empty, the keys still dangling in the ignition. Very odd. I shone my flashlight around the cab one more time, checking under the seats and in the glove compartment, but I found nothing. I decided to run the plates through our park database. I walked back to the ranger truck. I keyed in the license plate number into the laptop mounted in my truck. The database returned a hit. The truck was registered to a man who had a reservation for one of the campsites in the park. This information at least explained why the truck was in the park, but why would someone leave their vehicle like this? Was he in trouble? Lost in the woods, perhaps? I scribbled down the man's name and campsite number on my notepad, preparing to investigate further. The situation had escalated from a simple abandoned vehicle 
to a potential missing person in the park. The stillness of the night now felt more ominous than peaceful. A stark contrast to the sense of tranquility I had felt just moments earlier in my patrol. A gnawing feeling of unease began to take hold of me. A sensation that something was decidedly off. My instincts screamed that something was amiss. I went back to the truck and I turned off the truck's headlights. I let my eyes adjust to the darkness. The moon provided scant illumination, but it was enough for me to find my way. I headed towards the trail. As I reached it, I clicked on my flashlight. Its beam pierced the night. The trail loomed before me, its entrance marked by the gate, which was open. The lock lay on the ground. All of these trails had been closed at sundown. I was puzzled how it had gotten unlocked, but I decided that I'd figure that out later. The trail seemed the most likely place the driver of the abandoned truck had gone. My mind raced with scenarios. Perhaps he had ventured out for a late night walk and gotten lost or worse injured. I stepped onto the trail, the beam of my flashlight leading the way. The path was familiar. I had walked it countless times in the daylight. But now it took on a more sinister aspect under the cloak of night. Every rustle in the underbrush, every snap of a branch seemed amplified, heightened by the sense of urgency pulsing through me. As I moved further along, my eyes scanned the ground for signs of passage. Footprints, disturbed leaves, anything that might indicate the direction the driver had taken. I called out a few times. Hello, park ranger. If you can hear me, please respond. But my voice seemed to be swallowed by the dense forest. I pressed on. The trail wound uphill, leading into a particularly dense part of the forest. The trees here grew close together, their branches intertwining above to form a canopy that almost completely obscured the sky. The flashlight in my hand was more necessary than ever, its beam the only source of light. I called out the man's name, the one registered to the truck, several times as I made my way along the trail. David Miller! Again, my voice seemed to hang in the air for a moment before being swallowed up by the forest. There was no reply, not even the faintest sound of movement in response. The silence that followed each call was unnerving. In fact, there had been silence ever since I had arrived on the scene. It was a stark contrast to the usual nocturnal chorus of the woods. After about ten minutes of fruitless searching and calling, a knot of concern tightened in my gut. It was clear that I wasn't going to find Mr. Miller on my own. I decided that it was time to head back to the truck and call for backup. The situation had escalated far beyond a simple check and I needed more resources to conduct a proper search. Turning around, I started retracing my steps back down the trail, my mind racing with possibilities and concerns. As I made my way back towards the road, the beam of my flashlight swept across the forest floor still searching for any sign of the man, and that's when I saw it. Something on the edge of the trail that I had missed before. Or maybe it hadn't been there before. My heart skipped a beat. I slowed my pace, squinting into the gloom. There, partially hidden under the dense underbrush, was what seemed to be a small pile of clothes. I approached cautiously. A mixture of dread and curiosity quickened my pulse. As I got closer to the pile of clothes, a shocking realization hit me. It wasn't just clothes. There was a child, a little girl, probably about seven or eight years old, lying on her side. She was wearing pajamas, her eyes closed as if she were merely sleeping. Kneeling down beside her, I was at a loss. Why was a child out here in the middle of the woods, alone and asleep at this hour? 
It defied all logic, all understanding. I reached out tentatively, my hand hovering over her shoulder, unsure of what to do. Was she lost, hurt, or worse? Hey, kiddo, I said softly, my voice barely above a whisper. There was no response. She remained still. I noticed that her chest was rising and falling with quiet breaths. That was a relief. The scene felt surreal, like a dream or a scene from a movie. But the cold, hard ground beneath me and the night air on my skin were stark reminders of the reality of the situation. I scanned the area, half expecting to see someone, a parent, a guardian, but we were alone. It was just me and the child and the oddly silent forest. My mind was racing, trying to piece together how she could have ended up here. Did she have some connection with Mr. Miller? Anyway, I knew that I had to get her to safety, to wake her gently, and then maybe I could find out what had happened. I reached out tentatively to shake the girl, to rouse her from what seemed to be a very deep sleep. My hand gently touched her shoulder, a soft, cautious motion, and that's when I froze, my blood turning to ice in my veins. As my hand made contact, her eyes fluttered open, but they weren't the eyes of a child. They were entirely black, devoid of iris or white, just an endless void that seemed to swallow the very light around us. I recoiled instinctively, a shock of terror coursing through me. For a moment, I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe. I was caught in the gaze of those unnatural eyes. I felt an unexplainable chill that seeped into my bones. There was no logical explanation for what I was seeing. Eyes like that didn't belong to a human being. They were something else, something otherworldly. In that instant, faster than I could react, the situation spiraled into chaos. The girl, still locked in that unnerving black-eyed stare, opened her mouth and let out a scream. But it wasn't the scream of a child lost or scared. It was monstrous. A sound so chilling and unnatural that it seemed to come from another world. The scream shattered the silence of the forest echoing through the trees, reverberating off dense foliage. It was a sound that seemed to cut right through me, setting every nerve on edge. Scrambling back, I felt a primal urge to flee, to put as much distance as possible between myself and the girl. My feet slipped on the damp forest floor, my breath coming out in ragged gasps. The scream continued, impossibly long and bone-chillingly eerie. It stretched on for seconds that felt like hours, piercing the night and setting my nerves on fire. The scream reverberated through the air, vibrating through the trees and the ground beneath me. Then, as abruptly as it had begun, the scream ceased. The sudden silence was almost as jarring as the scream itself. My heart pounded in my chest as I rushed away, putting about ten feet between myself and the girl. I turned to look at her again, my breaths coming in short, sharp gasp, my mind reeling from what had just happened. She was now sitting up, her small frame illuminated by the dim light from my fallen flashlight. Her black eyes were fixed on me, unblinking, an intense stare that seemed to see right through me. There was no expression on her face, no hint of emotion or intent, just that unnerving, steady gaze. I stood there, frozen, unable to tear my eyes away from hers. The girl's stare was paralyzing, a look that was far too knowing, too ancient for a child her age. It was as if she was not looking at me, but into me, into the very depths of my being. 
Fear, raw and unfiltered, coursed through me. This was no ordinary child lost in the woods. This was something else. Something inexplicable and terrifying. Slowly, with a deliberate, almost unnatural grace, the girl rose to her feet. She stood there in the dim light, her small stature in stark contrast to the overwhelming sense of dread that she exuded. She couldn't have been more than three and a half feet tall, yet the air around her seemed to thrum with a power that was chilling. I feel even to this day that she was the most dangerous thing that I have ever encountered. As she stood there, her black eyes never left mine, maintaining that unnerving, unbroken stare. The way she moved was unsettling too, too poised and controlled for a child her age. As she stood there, a transformation came over the girl's face, one that chilled me to the bone. It was a look of utter contempt, a disdain too palpable and intense like a physical blow. Her eyes, those deep, dark voids, bore into me with a stare of an adult filled with loathing. The expression was so incongruous on her young face, so jarringly out of place, that for a moment I couldn't comprehend it. It was the look of someone who despised me, despised everything that I represented with a depth of emotion that should have been impossible for a child her age. This wasn't mere dislike or the petulance of a child. This was something far deeper, far more malevolent. It was as if she saw me not as a person but as something lesser, something unworthy. The intensity of her gaze, coupled with the inexplicable dread that filled the air, rooted me to the spot, fear gripping me, telling me that I was in the presence of something wholly other, something dark and unfathomable. Then, breaking the heavy silence, the girl spoke. Her voice was jarring. It carried an articulation and depth that was completely at odds with her apparent age. It was too low-pitched, too resonant, as if each word carried the weight of ages. You tread where you should not. She said, her voice echoing slightly in the stillness of the forest. This realm is not for the likes of you. Leave now before the forest claims what it rightfully owns. Her words sent a shiver down my spine. They were spoken with a certainty and authority that no child could possess. The air around us seemed to grow colder with each syllable, and the darkness felt heavier, as if her words were weaving an unseen barrier around us. I wanted to move to run, to break free from the spellbinding terror of her gaze, but my body refused to obey. It was as if I was caught in a waking nightmare, trapped in a moment where time and reason held no sway. The chilling reality of what was happening, of what this child represented, was overwhelming leaving me at the mercy of the unknown forces at play in this surreal, frightening encounter. Without another word or a glance, the girl turned away from me. Her movements were fluid, almost ethereal, as she began walking back into the forest. Each step she took seemed to carry her further away from reality, from the realm of the explainable. I watched, still rooted to the spot, as she moved with a grace that belied her years, her figure blending into the dense woods. The darkness of the forest seemed to embrace her, swallowing her form until she was no more than a wisp of a shadow among shadows. In just moments, she had disappeared completely, leaving no trace of her presence except for the lingering sense of unease that clung to the air. The forest had reclaimed her, or perhaps she had never truly been a part of our world at all. 
I didn't say a word, my mind a whirlwind of confusion and fear. With urgency fueling my steps, I grabbed my flashlight and rushed back down the trail towards the road. Every shadow seemed to shift. Every rustle in the underbrush felt like a harbinger of something unseen. I stumbled several times, my boots catching on roots and rocks that I would have easily navigated under normal circumstances. But nothing about this night was normal. I kept looking around, my flashlight's beam darting from tree to tree, half expecting to see the girl reappear or something worse lurking in the shadows. The forest, once so comforting, now felt alien and threatening. Every step taken was one of escape, a desperate attempt to put distance between myself and the surreal encounter that I had just experienced. Breathless and rattled, I finally reached the road where my truck was parked. The sight of it, solid and familiar, was a small comfort in the night that had turned my world upside down. I didn't waste a moment. I got inside quickly. I locked the doors the moment I shut them. My hands were shaking as I started the engine, the familiar rumble, a grounding noise in an otherwise silent night. I turned around and drove down the road, my eyes darting nervously in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see something or someone following me. After a few minutes, I felt safe enough and I reached for the radio to call back to the station. This is Sullivan, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. I need backup at my location. There's, there's something out here. I didn't know how to explain what had just happened, how to put into words the surreal and terrifying encounter with the child. For now, I just needed to get back to safety, to somewhere that I could try to make sense of the night's events. My words came out in a ramble, a jumble of sentences as I tried to explain the incomprehensible. I found a girl in the woods, but, but her eyes, they were black, completely black, and th then she, she just vanished. I said, there was a moment of silence on the other end. Sullivan, are you pulling my leg? It's not Halloween, you know. Bill Martinez, the other ranger, replied, his tone light, thinking it a joke. No, I'm serious, I insisted, my voice tense. This happened. I don't know how or why or... But it did. She was there. Then she walked off and she wasn't. And her eyes... Well, I can't explain it. But it wasn't normal. The radio was quiet as Martinez digested my words. I'm sure he didn't fully believe me. But his tone shifted, becoming more somber. It's all right, buddy. Um, I believe you. Head back to the station now. We'll, we'll figure this out. Relief washed over me at his acknowledgement. It was real. I hadn't imagined it. I would, I would tell him. I acknowledged his instructions and I focused on the drive back. My mind was still reeling from the night's events, but I was grateful for the support. Maybe not real, but it would be waiting for me at the station. At least I would be safe. When I arrived back at the station, the atmosphere was thick with concern, some skepticism, and curiosity. I quickly briefed Bill on the situation, my words tumbling out in a rush. When I mentioned the truck and the missing camper, well, he kind of took that serious, and without wasting any more time, we decided to head to the campsite of the man and investigate. It was the best lead we had. I suspect that Bill thought I had lost my mind and thought that we would find the man there and that would be the end of all this. That wasn't what would happen. When we arrived at the campsite, a sense of unease settled on us instantly. The place was deserted. The camp was set up, with a tent pitched and sleeping bag rolled out. It was as if the occupant had just stepped away for a moment. The fire pit held the remnants of a fire. The flames had burned down to almost nothing, leaving behind a soft orange glow amidst the ash. 
The scene was eerily silent. The crackle of the dying fire, the only sound in the still night air. As we searched the campsite, everything seemed normal. Like I said, it was as if the camper had simply walked off. There were no signs of a hurried departure. But the more that I looked, the more that something, well, like I said, it felt off. A subtle dissonance that I couldn't immediately put my finger on. I walked around inspecting the area. The food supplies were neatly arranged on the table. There was a half-finished cup of coffee that sat near the fire, its contents now cold. This doesn't make any sense, I murmured, feeling a prickling sensation at the back of my neck. Bill nodded in agreement, his eyes scanning the tree line. The normalcy of the camp was disturbing for some reason. It was too quiet, too still. Something about the scene felt staged, too. It was too perfect, like a snapshot paused in time. This sense of wrongness lingered in the air, an undercurrent of unease that belied the seemingly peaceful campsite. About 50 yards away through the dense forest, I could see the flickering light of a fire from another campsite. We should check that out, I suggested, eyeing the distant light. Maybe they saw something or know something about the camper. Why left in a hurry, I guess. Martinez nodded in agreement. Yeah, any information could help at this point. We started walking through the campsite, navigating through the underbrush and the tall trees. The forest was quiet. The only sound, the crunch of leaves and twigs beneath our boots. The glow of the fire grew brighter as we approached, casting long shadows that danced upon the forest floor. You know who's at this site? I asked. Yeah, an old couple with their grandkids, Bill replied. As we entered the campsite, we saw two tents and a campfire. A man, the grandfather, was up, sitting by the fire. His face wore an expression of concern. As we approached, I introduced ourselves. Good evening, sir. I'm Ranger Sullivan, and this is Ranger Martinez. We're checking on the campsites tonight. Is everything okay here? The grandfather nodded, but his face was lined with worry. We're fine, but something odd happened earlier. We met the man from the campsite over there. He gestured in the direction that we had come from. Seemed like a regular camper, a nice guy. We met him earlier, talked to him briefly, then we went our ways. A little after 11, my wife, grandkids, and I, we went to our tents. Here the man paused, collecting his thoughts. Well, then... A little after midnight, we were woken up by loud noises. They were, they were unsettling. When we got out of the tents, we saw that guy driving his truck out of the site. He was driving fast, kind of reckless. It scared the grandkids. It took us a while to calm him down. It bothered me, too. I, I couldn't sleep after it. Something, something feels wrong, so I've been up keeping an eye on things. His account added a layer to the mystery. The abandoned campsite, the hurried departure of its occupant, it all painted a picture of something having gone wrong. But what were the sounds? What had driven the man to flee like that, and how did it connect to what I had experienced in the woods earlier? The questions multiplied, each without a clear answer. We asked the grandfather a few more questions, but he really didn't have any information. So we thanked him, and then we left their campsite. Bill and I headed back to the other side. Once we got back there, we stood amidst the abandoned camp. The situation felt more complex and unnerving now. What do you make of all of this? I asked Bill, my voice low. It's strange, Sully. Something must have happened that spooked the guy. But what? He replied, his brow furrowed in thought. We talked for a while and then decided that the best course of action was to return to where I had found the abandoned truck and the trail where I encountered the girl. 
Before leaving the campsite, we made sure to extinguish the fire completely, dousing the embers and stirring the ashes. Then we got into our truck and started our drive towards the location of the abandoned truck and the trail. As we left the campsite, I glanced back at the grandfather's campsite. He was still there, sitting by his fire. We drove on, the truck's headlights cutting through the darkness. After a few minutes, we reached the location where I had found the abandoned truck. It was still there, blocking the road. Bill and I got out and searched the truck again, but found nothing new. Everything was as I had left it. We started to look around the area again, being a bit more thorough this time. I picked up the broken lock from the gate leading to the trail. The lock looked like it had been torn apart. How that's possible, I'm not sure. As we stood inspecting the lock from far off in the forest, we heard it. A weird cry, distant but distinct. It wasn't like any animal sound that I knew. It was high-pitched, almost human, but it was warped, distorted. We both froze, listening intently. The sound sent a shiver down my spine, reviving the eerie feeling of dread from earlier in the night. The sound lingered in the air for a moment before fading into the night, leaving us with a heightened sense of alertness and a deepening sense of unease. With a deep breath, we started down the trail. The towering trees on either side of the trail seemed to loom over us, their branches swaying gently in the night breeze. We moved cautiously, our eyes scanning the underbrush and the sides of the trail for any signs of a disturbance. The further we went into the forest, the shadows seemed to grow thicker. About a hundred yards down the trail, my light landed on something. There, partially hidden by a fern, was my hat. I must have lost it earlier in the night when I encountered the girl. In all the excitement, I hadn't even noticed. It lay there, a mundane object, yet in that moment. It was a grim reminder of what I had experienced. I bent down and picked it up, turning it over in my hands. The fabric was damp with dew. Just then, we heard the sound again, that strange, high-pitched cry echoing through the trees. It was closer this time, more distinct, yet still unidentifiable. The sound sent a chill down my spine, and I saw Bill tense up beside me. We stood there momentarily frozen, the cry reverberating around us. With the eerie cry still echoing in our ears, we resumed our search, though now far more cautious. Every shadow seemed to take on a life of its own. Every rustle of leaves was a potential sign of danger. But we combed through the area meticulously. But despite our thorough search, we found no trace of the missing man. The forest gave up no clues, the trees standing silent and indifferent to our quest. The deeper we went, the more the sense of unease grew, a tangible presence that seemed to hang in the air like a thick fog. Equally, there was no sign of the girl. A part of me was relieved. The last thing I wanted was to come face to face with her again, although a part of me did think that Bill seeing her would be comforting. At least I would know that I wasn't crazy. Finally. With no leads to follow, and the woods offering no answers, we made our way back to the truck. Once back at the truck, we called for backup. The situation was beyond our capacity to handle alone. Soon, a major search operation was underway, involving several rangers and local authorities. The forest was combed, every possible hiding place and trail checked but it was as if the man that we were looking for had vanished into thin air. Days turned into weeks, and still, there was no sign of him. Not a trace. His disappearance remained an unsolved mystery, a file gathering dust on an office shelf. 
a story occasionally recounted but never concluded. Equally elusive was the girl, or whatever she was. The creature I had encountered on the trail that night never appeared again. No one else ever saw her, and no evidence of her existence was ever found. She remained a phantom, a chilling memory that I carried with me. The search was eventually called off and the case grew cold. The forest returned to its usual state, a place of beauty and tranquility. But for me, it was forever shadowed by the events of that night. I managed to stay on for about six months. But eventually, I couldn't take it and I submitted my two weeks notice. The forest, once a place of peace and a refuge for me, had become tainted with an indelible sense of dread and terror. No matter how much I tried to push the memories to the back of my mind, they clung to me. A persistent shadow that darkened my days and haunted my nights. The decision to leave was not easy. Being a park ranger had been more than just a job. It was a part of who I was. But after what I had seen, the strange, unexplainable events, I knew that I couldn't continue to work in those woods. Since then, I've never returned to those woods. I've kept my distance from forests in general, staying in places where the sky is wide open and the only shadows are those cast by buildings, not trees. The creeping feeling of dread that has followed me since that night is a constant reminder of the unexplainable and the unknown that lurks just beyond the realm of understanding.